ready to go. Okay, welcome to episode six of Talking Prisoner. You're with myself, Matt Batten, and Ken Mulholland. We've got another amazing guest today. This guest appeared in the last season of Prisoner. She appeared in 25 episodes. Appeared in the first episode where we were introduced to the Hellhole Blackmore prison and Governor Craven and appeared in the final ever episode of Prisoner. Our guest has also appeared in many Aussie TV shows such as Neighbours, Janus, Acropolis Now, A Country Practice and Neighbours. She also appeared in a great Aussie movie called The Big Steel and she played Michelle Brumby, Brumby Tucker in Prisoner. Welcome to Talking Prisoner, Cheryl Monks. Hello. Hi, Matt. Hi, Ken. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. How are you, Ken? Fantastic. All, All right. the better for you, Cheryl. <laughs> oh, shucks. Thanks. <laughs> like I said before, I still can't believe you just have not aged. You still look like... Oh, thank you. Thank on... you. I mean, it was only, only 35 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? It's hard to believe. Um, now, we've got a lot of prisoner questions, of course, but before we get into that, can we learn a little bit about your childhood growing up? What were you like in school and what subjects did you enjoy the most? Well, I was a little bit of a chatter. I liked to have a talk at school, unfortunately, which um, got me into a bit of trouble occasionally. I always danced and sang and mucked around. I loved performing. I um I started calisthenics when I was about three and I did dancing, jazz ballet and all of that. So I was a very active little person, always on the go, always, as my mum used to say, I never walked anywhere. I danced or cartwheeled everywhere for a large part of, I did, a large part of my youth. I was always active, always performing. As I said, um, I had three sisters who I'm sure I drove crazy most of the time. Um, I'm the second eldest of the four girls. I always, yeah, mucked around. But at school, at high school, my my talking got me into a bit of a trouble. Bit of trouble, yeah. It, all, my reports always read that she's a lovely girl, but talks too much, or she distract <laughs> uh, distracts others and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, that didn't um, hold me in good stead, and I kind of failed a couple of years, you know, <laughs> and then went on to. Um, study drama at Box Hill TAFE and dance and drama and as I said and, and loved it and went really well because it was in the field that I was interested in. And what were your parents hoping for you to be when you left school? They knew I think at an early age that I'd probably go into something to do with the arts yeah. I'm sure as I said I was always dancing and acting and performing and singing and mucking around and I'm sure that's what they thought the area of um, expertise that I'd go into. I was always putting on performances and concerts for them with my sisters or with my girlfriends, always always choreographing dances and stuff like that. So I don't I think they were just pleased probably that I was I was going to do something that I loved. So yeah, I don't think they were surprised that I got into acting eventually. So so you actually the the acting side of things was something that was gradually growing and blossoming apart from all the the dancing and, and the calisthenics and all that sort of thing. Yep. So then you 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 started to seriously think about becoming. I did. A I did. Pro pro probably from when I was about eleven, maybe. I I, I particularly like musicals. You know, um, Mum would often take us all to, you know, matinee performances of uh, shows when they were like seventeen dollars a ticket not $170 a ticket and she'd take all of us girls there and I think the love of performing really um, stepped up when I was about 11 and then yeah I, I was not good academically let's just say that and um, and then when I got into drama doing drama at Box Hill I, I thought I would do it professionally seriously but I didn't know how to go about it and I didn't think it was actually really going to happen do you remember the magazine TV Week there yes. was a magazine, TV Week. There was TV Scene and TV Week. And in TV Week, they were advertising for unknowns to come and audition for um, a, a four-part miniseries called In Between, about four young kids growing up in Melbourne. And there was um, a Turkish girl, a Cambodian boy, and a um, Macedonian boy, and they wanted 
wanted an Australian girl, like a young Australian girl. And so I saw it advertised. They used to advertise things like auditions. Yeah. And uh, and I just took a women called up and they said I could come in and I got that. I got the part. We won a lot of awards. And in fact, I think it was a HSC, the HSC, we're going back, not VCA, but HSC um, component back in the day. It was the book, the in-between book and the movie and kids did something on that um so and then it kind of led from there and I thought oh maybe I could do this for a living you know wow. so that's probably really it was a slow burn you might say yeah. and was there was there anyone that you sort of looked up to as an actor or an actress that sort of made you want to push into that not not really um look as I said I loved <laughs> shows musicals like cabaret and you know, a chorus line and things like that. So I loved all of, I loved all of that. But as far as an Australian actor, not really. I I don't think until later on after I kind of started looking at it a bit closer. Um, I remember seeing um, Rocky Horror when I was 11, which was, yeah, I was really young and it was a big family discussion. Should we let her go? You know, is it appropriate? I might have been 12, 11 or 12. I got the green light and I went and saw it. And I, like, I loved, it was Reg Livermore was in the lead as Dr. Frankenfurter back then. It it was in a little dingy theatre down St Kilda Way. I can't even remember. I'd never seen anything like it, of course. And and, and I love that. And I wanted to be part of that. But um, as far as serious actors, not really, not at the time. Like I said, I don't think I really thought it was kind of just grew as time went on. And and then all of a sudden I was in the industry. It kind of just it happened around me. I, you know, I didn't say I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. It just kind of one thing led to another and I doors opened in certain areas. I was very, very fortunate like that. Awesome. What, what were your, uh, your parents doing? They weren't in, in the TV industry as such, but what did they They do? should have been. <laughs> They should have been. Dad's a bit of a comedian and mum mum and dad loves to dance. He always dances. They're still alive. They're um, um, dad's 87 and mum's 85. Yeah, dad's always been really active and um, any dinner dance we went to, one of us girls, would be, he'd be up, you know, we'd be on the dance floor or any wedding very quickly and mum used to sing. So they've got that performance um, quality in both of them. Uh, so, yeah. So And mum used to be part of choirs. And like I said, she loved musicals as well. So she'd always be singing and showing us, um, you know, taking us to shows and stuff. So they're both very theatrical. And in another life, I think they may have been on the stage or in movies. That's great, though, how they sort of, you know, they supported you to, to want to do acting and, and performing and things like that. Yep, yep, okay. always, always. Yeah. Very proud. I read an interesting story about you, and I want to confirm if it's if it's right. There's a you do voiceover work, and I do. do? Story how you used to annoy all your sisters reading stories out loud at night. Is, is, that, yes. is that true? <laughs> yes, yes. One sister in particular that I shared a bedroom with. Um, And she's nearly five years older than me and she was quite sensible and she'd like to quietly read in her head, sitting up in bed just before we'd go to sleep. And I'd sit there and I'd have my book and I'd do all the character voices and read out loud and annoy the hell out of her. And I think that's where the voiceover, I mean, it was part of acting as well. You know, the voiceovers came from that. I'd I'd be doing all the character voices and, and she'd be constantly telling me to shut up, shut up, read in your head. I'd be like, no. And very expressive, and yeah, I drove her crazy. Poor, poor sister. Are you still doing voiceover? Have you done anything that we'd probably know that, that fans would know? I, I do, I do still do voiceovers. Um, I used to do beacon lighting for 17 years. I did the this week at beacon lighting, we've got great exterior lights <laughs> and fans on sale. Yes, wow. so come on down to beacon sale on now. So that was me for 17 years. And, um, and I did all uh, all their on hold messages and website and all of that for, for a long time. Um, and I've done Sports Girl and Maya and I kind of 40 Winks. I did for, was it 40 Winks? Yes, I did 40 Winks for a little while. I, it, I've been doing that probably um, not long after I started on Prisoner. It was kind of a filler in between being out of work. So, and then eventually when work became quiet, I do more and more voiceovers. I did one. Um, not long ago uh, for a, a producer friend of mine 
for mental health. So it was more of a, like a training film, if you will. And I've done aged care stuff. So there's a lot of um, stuff that I've done that don't always make it to mainstream listening. Is voiceover work a lot different? Obviously, it's different to acting, but is it more, is it harder or is it easier? Do you find it? It's different. In, in many ways, it's probably easier, but you do, uh, you get given a script on the day. I mean, there's, you're not, you don't have pages and pages, you don't have to learn it. So, you know, there'll be a 30 second voiceover radio commercial or TVC or 15 second. And you do have to speak very quickly sometimes and uh, get the words right. And there can be some real tongue twisters in there. I mean, they do edit it and de-breath it and make you sound smoother and more lovely than what you usually are but I look I love doing voiceovers and I mean I love acting too but I love doing voiceovers because you turn up on the day sometimes and you just you've got to work on the fly and you know and that way it's good fun and you meet lots of interesting people back in the day when there was a little bit more money in in the industry you'd get to work with a lot of fantastic actors and you'd go in and do like I'd work with you know actors that I may not usually work with you know in the comedy field I've worked with Magda Shabinsky with voiceovers and um, Peter Moon and um, I can't think of names I'm terrible at names but lots of different actors that maybe you may not cross paths with ordinarily so in that way it's it's look I love it and it's great fun but it's not as a lot of people are working from home, so I don't get to go into studios as much as what we used to and lack of funding and money and all of those sorts of things that tend to happen. That's what I wanted to yeah. ask. It's overwork. I mean, during lockdowns and things, you, so you can still do them? Like you can do them from home and send off? True. Yeah. Yep. I, and I and that's what I'm excited about in my new place. I've got like an office um, that I'm hoping to turn into a bit of a studio. So maybe I can do more from home because that's the way it's going these days. So I'm a bit excited about that. I haven't had anywhere that, although I used to get this lovely fellow that um, from out our way that I do like some real estate ads for him, local sort of thing. And in the muddy that I used to live in, the acoustics were great. And we just set up a microphone in the middle of my lounge room and record from there. So, so yeah, I'm excited that in my new place I can I can um, maybe get a studio up and running. Now we're going to get to one of the greatest TV shows in Australia, <laughs> Australia's history. Now this is a this is a multiple question. How how did you get the part for Brumby? And can you tell us about the auditioning process? how that came about and and do you remember much from the audition itself? Before I'd I'd done a the four-part miniseries in between that I'd mentioned earlier and I didn't have an agent I didn't even know how to go about doing that and one of the producers from in between recommended an agent so I went and and had a chat to them and back in the day they were one of the first agents I believe in Melbourne called Frog Management. It's a long story as to why they were called Frog Management, but a lot of well-known people on the books, including the likes of Bud Tingwell, who also prisoner, yeah. And a lot of, there were a lot of prisoner um, actors and actresses on the books there. So I went and chatted to them and it just so happened that at the same time, there was an audition coming coming up for prisoner for this character, um, Michelle Brumby Tucker. So um, I'd literally just been signed to them. They said they'd love to represent me. So they signed me and I went to, uh, where did I go? I I think it was somewhere in Richmond. I know it it wasn't out at Channel 10. Grundy Productions must have been based in Richmond. Yeah, they were. That'd be right. So I went there and um, I had a big piece to learn. It wasn't a conversation. My character was talking about her childhood and how rough her childhood was. And and I remember being nervous, of course, and learning um, this chunk of dialogue. And I went in and, and because it was a large piece to do, I kind of got in the zone when I went in. And as I said, I was nervous, but excited at the thought. And I, I had nothing to lose. I thought, no one has any expectations of me. I'm new into the industry. So I didn't feel that pressure and I was a fresh face and I went in there and I did the audition. And because it was this large piece to learn and perform, it didn't really matter about the little words here and there, as long as I got the meaning right. And I remember crying during the audition, like getting teary because it was talking about a childhood. And I think they liked that, but it was because I could really get in the moment and feel that um, she had had experienced and um, 
I got it. I think that helped that it was a large piece and I just got in the moment. And I had I had my ears all pierced all the way up back in my punky day. So I had all my <laughs> earrings in and I already had like a, the mullety kind of look happening. So I think that even though the character Brumby didn't have all the earrings in, I think that helped the look too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's what I remember. You come in the last season of Prisoner, so season eight. I did. Was it a show that you actually hoping to get on early? I mean, it was pretty big at the time, but was there times prior to Prisoner that you were sort of like, oh, I wish I could get onto that show? No, not at all. I, not at all. And I remember watching it and I had I would never have dreamed, never have dreamed that I would get on it. And and it was it was even it was really popular even back then and um kind of pushing boundaries with women being strong characters and there was swearing you know like get stuffed you know mole <laughs> all those great things that that was pushing the boundaries and I loved it and um, I did the same as a lot of Australian kids was I'd sneak a look through the frosted glass sliding doors I wasn't allowed to watch it while my um, sister was at um, Girl Guides I'd crawl out commando and sneak a look at you know what was going on I loved it I never would have dreamed being on it I never had any aspirations uh, not in a million years so I was uh, yeah I, I was blown away that I got the part I couldn't believe it I, I had never envisioned being on it so I was very very fortunate to win the role of Brumby was there a lot of other people wanting that like at the audition for that role as well when you were there yeah yeah there was I, I don't know who there I just remember and thinking who am I I just kind of went in with just let's just have a go and see what happens and I got it but I do remember uh vaguely that there were a few girls in the foyer along with me probably a lot more prepared than I was maybe I don't know but I yeah I got it so when you when you come on prisoner in season eight did you know that was going to be the last season when you got the part no I didn't and they didn't I don't know what you remember Ken but I re remember because my contract was going to be I had the 12 weeks or whatever it was uh, and then they were going to re hopefully extend it that's how they kind of worked it you've got a set contract and then with the hope of the character going on I guess it gave them the opportunity to see how your character panned out and then if it was successful and people enjoyed your character and you did it well then you would go on and so when I got on there there was no talk of it finishing I remember being just as shocked as everybody else probably about halfway through there was talk of it it kind of happened really quickly is do you remember that Ken from uh, the crew's Point of view from from the crew's point of view we we knew a little bit <sighs> before but not right. that not that long before we'd been kind of expecting it right because it had gone for eight years you know so we didn't have the concept of something like neighbors running for five thousand years or whatever yeah. it is now yeah. but yes but yeah eight years was an awfully long run we were somewhat shattered when it, it happened. Did you did you know much about Brumby as a character when you auditioned for it, or was it was that you didn't have much background? No, they didn't. That, I mean, a little bit. But I, I look. I to be honest, I can't remember that. But they gave you a little bit of a blurb about her. And as time went on, I think once I'd gotten the role, they sort of let us know a bit more about it. But but for the piece that I'd auditioned for, there was. Like I said, she was talking about her life and her childhood and, and how rough it was. So uh, that that kind of um, explained a little bit of the background of Brumby. So when you got the part for Brumby, you know, you've done the audition, you've got the part. How, I mean, how did you find out you got the part? Did they give you a call and say... I can't remember. I think it was a call yeah. to the landline back in those days. Did you get overwhelmed that you're going to be on this high? I did. I was in shock. And I can't remember how much time I had to process it but I don't think it was very long I think things moved quite quickly like I had to come in for a wardrobe fitting and a chat about it and then I think from what I remember it, I was I was terribly overwhelmed and excited but it happened quite quickly which is probably for the best then you don't think about things too much it just kind of happens and then before you know it you're on the set and you know there you are so I was wrapped did you actually get any advice 
from any of the cast once you, you were on the set? And can you tell us a bit from your memory about the first day on the set? Uh, down, because my character came from another prison, we were on the set, um, we're, we started at OB, outside broadcast. So I didn't go to, go to Channel 10, firstly. So we started um, on location. I was overwhelmed. It was, it, it was a fast pace. Like I said, the, the other miniseries that I'd done first, um, it was about four young kids growing up in Melbourne. It was all of our first time. So we were taken through step by step. It was very gentle. We were shown, you know, with the miniseries that I'd done prior, shown how to read the call sheet. Um, it was on film. It was um, a slower pace. You know, we were really looked after. And then all of a sudden... Wham, Wait. bam, I'm on the set that has been, like you say, running for eight years. You know, everybody's got a job. It's go, go, go. Everybody knows what they've got to do. Um, everyone's got their role. You know, I was, luckily I was really prepared because it was a full on day for my character in particular. Not yeah, enough. and all of a sudden I'm acting in, in on the set with all these people that I, well, not, luckily it was mainly Glenda Lynn Scott who played Rita. It was mainly with her who was the only familiar face because the other characters were all being at another prison were all new and different. So I hadn't been watching them on the TV for the past eight years or however long. It was pretty full on. I was really, really quite nervous, but I used that nervous energy in the character of Rumby. Um, I pretended that um, I, th I thought then and there <laughs> the character of Rumby was going to be a nervy character. <laughs> So I pretended that that's how I thought her out. But then when I relaxed into the role, I had to maintain that same <laughs> nervousness. So I had to, you know, pretend like that's that's how she is. Oh, yeah, I, I thought that's how I was going to play her. But um, it worked for that character. Um, and it must have shown itself when I was in the audition. That's why I liked it. I used that nervous energy. Um, it was in, it, as I said, it was just after my 21st birthday. So it was... Um, late May, you know, it was down in Spotswood. So yeah. it was windy, it was cold, it was in a miserable um, environment. So it was really full on. It was overwhelming, but excitedly yeah. overwhelming. When you were obviously being so young and coming on The Prisoner, did anyone on the set sort of really take you under their wing, like another actor or actress on set? Uh, look, a lot of the older cast were like that. Um, Elspeth Ballantyne, Maggie Kirkpatrick, beautiful, beautiful, always very supportive of the younger cast coming in. Yeah. Glenda Lynn Scott, as I said, who played Rita, she was beautiful and a calming force always. No one really, really gave advice as such. Occasionally there'd be a little throwaway comment like, you know, watch out for this, maybe try this or do that. But everybody sort of stayed in their lane and respected each other so much that, you know, they thought, you've earned your place there so clearly you know what you're doing <laughs> um <laughs> but I mean look if I don't remember anybody actually sitting me down and giving me advice gorgeous um Victoria Rowland um who was another character that came from Blackmoor um was very supportive she was a little bit older than me so um and she'd come to acting a different way to me so she worked in the industry at the on the other side so she kind of knew how things ran from that standpoint everyone would just be very kind and a very giving performer experienced women on the set always looked after always were very um, generous you know with their time they're always very kind like that no, there were no egos and Maggie Kirkpatrick beautiful beautiful woman and uh, really funny really fun you know she could be so foreboding on the set as soon as she became the freak it was just magic to watch the difference because she's so not like that as a person you know and that's where credit to her acting all of a sudden you're in the green room with this woman that's scared the shit out of you for you know so many years like she's just been and you think go in there and she's just down to earth kind generous you know, just beautiful cast. We were really, um, you know, a real community, really um, a great team, I think, of women. Did you ever play Trivial Pursuit with her? No, I did not. Did you, I Ken? I <laughs> no, I didn't, but I, I have memories of, of going into the green room and seeing her and a couple of the other cast members playing Trivial Pursuit fan mail. 
did you get a lot of fan mail? I think I got a little bit at the time, but I still to this day get fan mail. It's amazing. Um, in particular from the UK, I get a, a few pieces every year. I It blows my mind um, that still to this day I get fan mail. I got some just the other day. Um, and, and and with a cards, fan cards in there, amazing. I mean, they're the most horrendous photos of Brumby Tucker ever. But um, I signed them and and returned it. I'm I'm just gobsmacked at um, the fact that still 35 years later, I'm still getting fan mail. It's incredible. I don't remember at the time. I, I'm I'm sure I did. I just wanted to actually ask you something before we got into um, Ken's question when you were talking about your first day. Was it a bit surreal being there, seeing people like Maggie Kirkpatrick and Elizabeth Valentine when you've seen them on TV for so long and then you're like... Oh, there. yes. Oh, oh, it's unreal. It's like it's like you've stepped into television land. It's like uh, hard to believe that you've been... You watch people on that screen for so long and then all of a sudden you're on the other side looking out. Like, it's, yeah. it is surreal. It's, it's quite bizarre. Um, I'm lucky in a way that... My first day, it was kind of a, um, I wasn't at Channel 10 because I, w- I don't know how I would have been if I was bombarded seeing all those women all at once. I mean, I was on the set. Um, I don't even know how long we were at it on the set at the other prison, if it was a couple of days or, or weeks, but I'm glad it was a gentle kind of, even though, as I said, it was overwhelming, break into... Um, meeting everybody i know a lot of actors have got different techniques when they're learning scripts so what was your you know memorizing lines and things like that when you got the script did you have any techniques that you used or um just repetition really and i'm sure i annoyed my sisters in helping me (laughs) learn my lines over and over sometimes to a mirror but just like one line at a time And then just adding to it and adding to it and closing my eyes and just repetition, repetition, repetition. And because it moves quite quickly, like we wouldn't be finished one episode and we'd be getting the script for the next one. You know, it was pretty, you know, you're still in that storyline and then you're moving on to the next one. Um, And if one was mainly on your character uh, and then, you know, like it was, it it was a quick, it was a great way to learn how to, um, the industry and how it works. It was a great learning curve, um, which held me up for other things thereafter that I did. But yeah, just repetition, getting people to read opposite me at home more so, and just, you know, having quiet moments and just repeating it over and over. That would have happened on your weekends as well, on your supposedly yes. days off. Yes, always. I tended to... Um, really leave the like I do that and do it the night before too because sometimes we'd go on set and there'd be changes too remember can we get a white script and then the changes would be in another color and Ooh. some episodes would have yellow purple pink pages of different of changes and it'd be like right. you know oh okay so I've just learnt that chunk and it's gone or it's been added to and yeah it, it was it was such a learning curve um to be resilient and to roll with the punches and to be always on your on your toes because things could change in the blink of an eye. You, the script was your Bible. It was right there with you right up until, like right in the set till it's done, really. Yeah. Could they Hold change on. the scene? Could they like film a scene and then go, hang on, that, that, no, that didn't look right. We're going to do it this way. Would that happen often? I don't think that would happen often, but I'm sure it happened. I can't remember off. I mean, they tweak it, but usually by the time, and you can probably confirm this, Ken, usually by the time we're filming it, things had been ironed out. Would that be right in saying that? Mostly, uh, although Mostly. There, were, there were scenes where we would get shot lists. DA would come down and handwrite our shot lists for, <sighs> for a scene. So we, oh, we my God. And then they'd come down and scribble it down uh, on each of the three cameras. And then wow. they'd here again and we'd just, well, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes learning your lines too much in advance wasn't the way to go. You kind of had to, for me, do it the night before. Or they'd pop a scene in like a pickup and you, it's a big wordy one that you haven't even learnt. So you'd be there, you'd have to run away for an hour and just go and learn it you know, and then we'd block it out 
you know, and then just try and remember it as best you could. You had to know your character. Let's just say that too. You had to think this is how Brumby is. I know that's how she, that character is. So you kind of understood the recipe of the characters and how things would play out too. Being in Studio B, when you finally, your character does come to um, Wentworth, can you, can you run the fans through what you remember of a typical sort of day on the set of Prisoner, apart from the, the annoying cameramen, of course? Um, <laughs> I know we used to have some rehearsal time where we, a, a couple of days there that we would block out scenes, we wouldn't film anything. And so we'd turn up just in our, in our civvies, in our civilian clothes, you might say, and have rehearsal days. But for filming, you'd uh, turn up at Channel 10, you'd get the call sheet the night before, uh, the day before for that day, like what time you've got to be on the set, what scenes they're shooting. Um, and you turn up at 5.30, 6, 6.30, go straight into wardrobe, get dressed in your, in your denims, and they'd have Brumby Tucker and they'd have the characters, like, for example, Brumby would often wear a pinafore. She wouldn't wear the overalls where another character like um, Roseanne Hull Brown's character would wear overalls, whereas my character always wore the dress. So you'd have, oh, a large array of different denim dresses and coloured shirts and skivvies or whatever. Um, and so you'd say, yeah, I'll wear that and that, but you roughly knew your, your wardrobe. So you get in your wardrobe, go to makeup and get nothing done because <laughs> we didn't wear makeup. We'd get powdered down a bit. My my mullet would get a little bit of a zhuzh maybe, a hairbrush through it, but maybe a bit of powder. That would be about it. Take the shine off your face. And then, it, like, it was very quick. And then you'd go to the green room and sit there. It would often be very, very cold from what I remember, always freezing, stand in front of the heater, get yourself a cup of coffee, um, maybe go over your lines. Probably, as Ken said, maybe some of them are playing Trivial Pursuit or card games. There was no social media to look at then. You'd read through magazines, sitting on the big velour couch. You had the big velour yeah. couch in the green room. You'd chit-chat. So you'd sit there and wait until the um, AD had come and, you know, assistant director or floor manager had come and, get you and you'd go in there and on the day of shooting I don't the, the director would be upstairs wouldn't he Ken Mostly, they wouldn't be on yeah. the floor then the, the, direct, the director would only be on the floor when you did rehearsals so they'd be talking through to the assistant director and they'd say we're going to block out for the cameras to block out where's what and lights would be changed and then it'd be let's do it and so you know to be a three camera set up and You'd try, have to hit your mark. Sometimes they'd tape them or you'd, you know, whatever. You'd say, okay, I'm in the door frame there. Move forward, Cheryl, because the lights. So it was kind of a bit of a technical run through more than anything by that stage. And then we'd film it and the day would begin. But um, it would, would, was fast paced. Um, there was none of this. I didn't feel it. Can I do it again? If, it, if you hit the marks, you did your lines. Occasionally... The director would say, try it a bit more, you know, this way or that way. But we'd usually already worked it out at rehearsals. So it's interesting you say about the, you know, oh, I wasn't feeling it. And didn't, I mean, you see a lot of that now. I mean, yeah. you guys back then were just brilliant actors. I mean, oh, thank you. Even I'm watching previous episodes now just to research things. And the acting's just, it's amazing. We had a lot of fun and we, we, and because we knew um, but the rehearsal days were great because you ironed everything out pretty much then as far as what was going through the character's head. You know, we talk about that, you know, what's where, remember where you've come from, what's Brumby just experienced, why is she upset, why is she angry, where is she going to? So we'd know what had come before because everything's filmed out of order for the most part, you know. So you've got to remember what's just happened even though you haven't you haven't filmed the scene that supposedly just happened. So you've got to remember, okay, I'm crying because this happened, but I haven't done that yet. So you've got to be, you know, in the moment that you've got to remember what's happened and what's about to happen. So you really had to know, know your shit. You know, you really did have to know it, know the order of it. 
you be responsible for your own character in many ways. You know, they're entrusting you to to be aware of all of that. Because at the end of the day, we were the ones on the screen. You know, we're the ones. At the end of the day, it's up to us and how we're going to be perceived by the audience. When you're out in public, when you're on prisoner, were you recognised a lot? When you, I, I did get recognised. It depended where I went. Um, when I was out of work, down at the Centrelink, <laughs> <laughs> after uh, in between jobs there for a while, I got recognised. It did. Re it depended where I was. After I did prisoner, and I, I virtually uh, a couple of weeks later went on to Neighbours. I had a guest role on Neighbours and I dyed my hair again. So I didn't have that Brumby Tucker look. And the fact that we wore no makeup, um, we looked pretty, you know, interesting to say the least. So when, if you had any makeup on or your hair was a different colour, people might look at me twice and think, where do I know her from? And I would get more of that. Like, did you used to, what school did you go to? I'd get a lot of that. Like they kind of knew and they weren't sure. So I did get recognised, but not hugely, that it was invasive. You got rid of the mullet after prisoner, I'm assuming. Well, I had to grow it out. It took a while. I had to grow it, and my hair was falling out, so it took a while. I've got a, uh, I've got a fan question from John Walters, who's in the UK. He wanted to know, you did a lot of scenes with Taya Stratton, who's now no longer with us. Can you tell us much about your time with Taya? She was beautiful. She was, um, I know, very sad that she's no longer with us. That was a shock when all of that that happened. She played Spider. No, yes, she did, oh. didn't she? Oh, that just came into my head. She did. She played Spider. And uh, she was a Victorian College of the Arts graduate, a VCA graduate. So she was pretty amazing. She, uh, I remember her character being very mannequin um, you know, quick-witted and, yeah, very full-on and just with, with the glint in her eye. She was she was a baddie, wasn't she, from what I remember? She was often the baddie and, and doing the wrong thing, according to whoever the top dog was at the time. Um, but she was lovely. She was, again, you know, from what I remember, very different to her character, um, very skilled actress, very kind, because there was a few of us that sort of, there was, that I think they were starting to give young actresses um, a go that were fresh and new to the industry like myself and Victoria Rowland and Taya Stratton and there were a couple of other actresses that came on the scene just before me and and during my time that were all new to the industry and it was like they were kind of you know giving us all a go at at something so wonderful so she she was gorgeous and and just a, a great actress, just a beautiful beautiful woman, and and very very sad that she she passed away. So I think she had a huge future ahead of her, and it's very sad that um yeah that didn't come to fruition unfortunately. Did starring in Prisoner open other doors for you? Um, you know, in the TV industry. Yes, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Um, because as I said, I I got into Neighbours. I mean, I auditioned for Neighbours. Um, and I got that literally within a couple of weeks of Prisoner ending. It was a, a guest role. I think my character, every now and then little pieces of information come into my head. Um, the character's name was Chrissy Adams, who caused a bit of trouble in Neighbours. So, I, yeah, I think it was a bit of a door opener, definitely. Because um, then I did Flying Doctors. I'd, I remember, um, and that was for Crawford's, I remember that I didn't have to audition for that role, which was amazing. I wanted to ask you about that, being on such a big show like Prisoner. Did you have to audition for other parts? Well, I, I did for Neighbours. Didn't have to for, um, and which I couldn't believe. And the actual um, episode was called Roxanne, which was about my character. That was about, it was a guest piece on Flying Doctors, but I didn't have to because the character in Flying Doctors was, uh, you know, this wayward girl, at, you know, tough, exterior which wasn't that far away from the from being on the prisoner character really she was a little bit tougher and, and and a different story but it was like they said hey well they did they said let's get Cheryl Monks to do that I didn't have to audition they offered me that role which was amazing with the likes of Re Rebecca Gibney and um I can't remember all the names <laughs> 
uh, it was a huge, huge role and lots of great gritty stuff in that, which I was, I loved. So um, yeah, I didn't, I think Prisoner did open the door for me um, and having that on your resume was a big help um, over the years with um, being asked to audition, even though other than the Roxanne character in Flying Doctors, I did another um, episode for Flying Doctors as well as a different character. Are you still um, surprised at how popular Prisoner is until this day? Yes. Um, amazing after so long, 35 years. I can't I can't believe it. It's wonderful. Uh, you know, it is an iconic piece of Australian television history and um, I'm grateful that, that people still watch it and love it. And, um, I, yeah, I'm blown away that it's still um, being talked about and, and loved so many years later. It's, it's fantastic. Two words. Gerda Nicholson. Oh, beautiful Gerda Nicholson. She she was lovely. She was lovely to me and, and she too has passed away. She uh, gave me, and it's funny because I've probably got it around here, but I don't know where. She gave me, I don't know if she gave it to everybody. I, I, I She probably did give something to everybody, but she gave me a little plate bowl of a, a, a beautiful um, Australian um, ceramicist artist and she gave it to me like she was leaving and she gave me a going away present um, and she said to me don't use it as an ashtray because I used to smoke back right then don't use it as an ashtray and look after it and I did use it as an ashtray because I was an idiot and I didn't look after it and it wasn't only for until years later that I realized the value of that and I've since, since become, and I'm not going to tell you who the artist is, I've since become a collector of this particular artist because Goethe gave me that, that little bowl. And, and it's amazing to be in her presence. She was just as gracious and gorgeous as she was as the warden, you know, with the bouffant. She was just as elegant and divine as she was on the screens in real life. I think she used to once or twice. I saw her doing Tai Chi or yes. some form of martial art in the dark of Channel 10 in between. In the, yeah, studio. Is that right? in the studio, she used to get yeah. all, like on rehearsal day, she'd go in there and do her. And I remember thinking, oh, and backing out quietly because she'd be in there doing her Tai Chi or. She, had, she, she and I had a tacit agreement she would come in and she would do that. I would be sitting writing, uh, researching or writing and so forth and so on, and we wouldn't speak. And I think I, when I was new on the set, I think I kind of came in and saw she was having this moment and it was beautiful and I just kind of backed away <laughs> and just let her be and then I understood. She was just a gracious beautiful, gentle, kind woman. And she was already iconic before coming on to, uh, I mean, she'd been in the industry, um, you know, in also in homicide, Matlock, everything for so many years. And then to work alongside her, she was just had a presence, didn't she, Ken? She was just a lovely, lovely lady, very elegant. She actually played beautiful. the officer on Prisoner before she became the governor, which was interesting. Did she? Yeah, the Barnhurst scenes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did she she was trying to Barnhurst she played uh yeah for two episodes she was an officer at Barnhurst wow I didn't know that <laughs> I can't imagine her being a screw <laughs> it was it's actually weird to see it because you go back and look at it it's like you were the governor and then you're a yes you're a wow was there ever a storyline that you suggested to the writers for Brumby was there something that you would have liked to have seen come in for her no the Brumby if if it went on for another series I may have suggested something but I, I no I would I was happy with the way Brumby was she was a lot of fun and um she was a bit naughty at times doing the wrong thing she kind of you know flipped you, you know who if she was on the right side of of um Rita of Glenda Lynn Scott's character but no I I wouldn't dare suggest anything at that stage I was a novice I was just happy to be there I mean as I said if time went on and if it was in conversation maybe I would have but I was just grateful to be to be part of it and be playing Brumby, yeah. Were you actually looking forward to working with anyone in particular? Was there someone in the cast that, that you really were hoping that you'd work with? I think I was just in awe of all of them. Like I said, it happened pretty quickly and I, I think maybe if it preliminary stuff, like uh, once I got the part, 
went on for too much longer. Maybe I would have thought of that, but I think it all moved quite quickly. And before I knew it, I was there um, and just blown away working with, with all of them. I guess Maggie Kirkpatrick probably, I think I was probably a little bit scared to be quite honest going in, you know, changed my mind in the, as soon as she opened her mouth and welcomed me, you know, that all that fear went away. She was beautiful. The first episode you're in is very iconic because we're introduced to Blackmore, which was always talked about on Prisoner. It was always threatened to the top dogs. I'm going to transfer you there, but we never saw it. So it was season eight, episode 77, which was written by Ian Coglin and Gail Melon. Oh, Melian, sorry. Ah. Directed by Kendall Flanagan and the cameramen were Wayne Lavender, Jeff Biggs, Ken Mulholland and Mark Collins. And it first aired on the 16th of September, 1986. That's your first episode. It was a huge episode for Prisoner at the time because we are introduced to Blackmore. And it's, you know, we're seeing Rita Connors transferred there. The first scene at Blackmore behind a cell door, you were listening to Governor Craven, uh, played by Ray Ma, and he opens the door and we are introduced to Brumby. What was it like filming your first scene with Ray Ma? Again, he was a pretty foreboding, formidable character. And also the fact that he, I think, can, Craven always wore dark glasses, didn't he? And he had, from what I remember, like he he just had this presence and this arrogance about him. So I, from what I remember, I think, again, most, most emotions that come to mind is fear, um, a little bit scared, um, a little bit intimidated, um, because again, Ray Ma had been on Australian television in various shows over the years prior to Prisoner and was a very well-known face. Um, and he had that boomy kind of voice and and being the warden. I think I was just a bit intimidated. I don't remember interacting with him on a personal level in between takes that much because I was a little bit fearful. And also, I think he also was in character a lot um, and yeah. kind of stayed in there in that character. So I wouldn't want to break that, you know, vibe that he was in that moment. So, but I do remember being a little, a little intimidated by, you know, by Ray Ma And I think he, from what I remember, he's just a big cuddly teddy bear. He's just a big, <laughs> big softy. Yeah. Yes, he was quite intimidating and he did stay in character a lot. Yes. But you're right, he was, he is a, a big cuddly teddy bear. teddy bear. The next scene we did touch on Victoria Rowland before, which is who played um, Spike, Spike, and who we hope will come on Talking Prisoner as well. But it's also a fan question from Jan Robinson in Highlands, Scotland. Did want to oh, ask wow. Spike working with uh, Victoria as well, which we did touch on for a little bit. She was beautiful, and because we the our two characters were friends and had come from the prisoner to, the prison from Blackmore together, I was very grateful to have someone that was experiencing going into the prisoner world together with her. Look, just a beautiful lady. Um, she had worked on other shows behind the scenes. I think she was, she did wardrobe on Cop Shop, I think, um, which hopefully she'll probably touch on back in the day. So she'd been behind the scenes. I don't know what motivated her to... And maybe she, because I know she was friends, I think, with Taya Stratton quite outside of Prisoner. I think that she may have gone to um, VCA with Taya. So they were already friends. So that helped our friendship as well, um, uh, like getting to know Taya uh, also because Victoria already knew her. Victoria was gorgeous and very kind. She was a little bit older than me. So she knew how things ran from behind the scenes, which I was still learning about. So I was very grateful that I had an offsider that was experiencing and coming into this um, at the same time. So, yeah, she was lovely, lovely, Victoria. Jan Robinson. Sorry, she had two questions. Sorry, that's what I've done. Yeah. Uh, you also want to know what it was like working with Roseanne Hull-Brown, who played Merle Jones. Well, it's funny because we were talking about I've got some photos um, of behind the scenes and Roseanne was always good fun she was always lovely and always um, um, very again very kind and the way she'd switch straight into being Merle was funny from one to who from who she was to to that character uh, but she was lovely I've got photos of her I, I, I there's certain photos stick in my mind that I took behind the scenes and ones of her you know mucking around in the corridors of Channel 10 nothing like the Merle character very intelligent bright woman uh, very switched on the uh, the outside of 
Blackmore was filmed in Spotswood at the old Metropolitan Melbourne Metropolitan Board yep. of Work, which is now the Science Works Museum. Was the inside filmed back at Nunawading or another location? And do you remember much about the inside of Blackmore? You're absolutely right. That's where it was filmed. And, and my, that's where I spent my first couple of scenes when I first started on Prisoner down there. It was cold and windy. A lot of the scenes, all the exterior shots, of course, were filmed down there, but a lot of the interior shots were filmed back at Channel 10 in Nunawadding, which was bizarre. So when we went to Channel 10 to do the interior shots, the way that they, the set designers made it look exactly how it was and would have been um, if it was down there. I mean, there were a lot of parts of uh, those where we filmed down at Spotswood where you, you couldn't get into um, you know, like there was the office, Craven's office, um, where we did an exterior shot of him in there. He was in there, but it was like an empty, rundown, dust-ridden room. So, so they just recreated an office back at Channel Ten, and wow. and likewise in other scenes. But yeah, we we did all the exterior shots down there and the interiors back at Channel Ten. And it's funny because years later, I took my sons down there when they were little boys to Science Works. And going there, the smell, you know how smells bring back memories? The smell of the, not that it smelled like the works, but <laughs> that dusty kind of old metallic, it had a certain smell about it, came flooding back and all these memories of, you know, the, those filming, filming down there. It was quite bizarre to go down there years and years later, taking my kids to, to play and, you know, do the interactive stuff at science works and I'm telling them mummy used to film there and they couldn't have cared less yeah. um, you know no interest whatsoever but yeah that was freaky going back and seeing it again I mean of course a lot of it it's changed there's a um there's, there's actually a there's a few fan questions I want to ask you so I wouldn't list them all but there's a scene in solitary which Craven calls the cage and readers in there Glenda Lynn Scott and there's a scene with you bringing lunch down to her under this like cage thing whatever it was yeah um, so there's a few fans that have asked what it was like working with Glenda because you had some you know you had a lot of scenes with her as well yeah yeah, yeah I re I vaguely remember the crouching and, yeah. and doing that I vaguely remember doing that scene and that was filmed on I think we were on site or there were parts of it okay. that were okay. I don't know I'm not sure but uh, look, gorgeous. She respected how I'd perceived the character of Brumby and wholeheartedly she'd never told me I should do it like this, do it like that. We just bounced. She was just so kind and um, just a lovely, lovely actress and a lovely woman and really made me feel at ease and, um, you know, let me do my the, the way I'd perceived the character to be and very kind performer, very giving and um, open to ideas and feedback and, and bouncing ideas off each other. Yeah, I was very lucky that I got to do those first few days. Most of my stuff was with Glenda. Wow. Okay, now we're getting into season eight, episode 78, written by Robert Greenberg and Andrew Kennedy and directed again by Kendall Flanagan. Cameramen were Wayne Lavender, Jeff Biggs, Mark Collins and myself. There's a scene at Blackmore with Rue Morgan, played by Sally McKenzie, the top dog of Blackmore, and Rita Connors. You have brokered, sorry, a fight between the two top dogs. Rue is holding a knife. Craven is up in his office watching Rita is beating Rue and Craven tells the officers to break it up. Do you remember much about shooting this scene and what it was like to shoot it? I, I do vaguely. And that's the scene I was talking about with Craven standing up and watching yes. the goings on. I remember that. And because um, it was really quite high up and he, and, and he was like this intimidating figure even then Sally McKenzie was Rue is that right Sally McKenzie yeah. and it's funny because she was yeah the top dog sort right. of coming to blows with the Rita character and she too is it's funny because she too is a very you know elegant kind of has a lovely presence about her and all of a sudden she's straight into the character of Rue really tough and scary and and, and it's really interesting to see the change from the person to the character but I, I remember it being exciting. There's a, the next scene where we cut to, I think it was a rec room in Blackmore and Rue's worked out that you've double-crossed her. 
because you've organized reader. And then they've got all this blood coming out of your nose because they're giving you a bit of a, a bit of a touch up. <laughs> How was all that film? Like what was what was actually coming out of your nose at that? Oh, time? it would have been just a little bit of red makeup of some sort, but I loved all those scenes. I loved anything. I think it's the dancer in me, my background. Anything to do with stunt work, I loved it. I remember there was fight scenes. I had cricket pads under my flared denim. Oh, I really? think I had pants on then. Yeah, because there was a broom or something whacked into my car, my shin. And I loved all that physicality of the scenes and it really got the adrenaline pumping and it really helped the, the scene. Like I'd, I'd say, go for it. Do like, just go for it. I, and I remember that with Flying Doctors, I was in a fight scene and I came away with bruises all over me and I, I wore them like a badge of honour. I loved it. Like... Like, I just love the physicality of the scene and it really enhanced that gritty feel to it. And I love, there was a lot of that kind of fighting and tough talk and, you know, the chin out and yeah, right kind of thing. But yeah, it would have just been makeup coming out. I loved all of that, that, that you know, good, clean fun, you know, good fight scenes. You know, lots of, when, I, when we'd run through the corridors and, you know, I loved all of that. I loved that. I, as I said, I think it's the dancer in me that enjoyed that. See, season eight, episode 79. Now, we've, we've got it written down as uh, Sean Nash and Peter Copeman were the writers, but it was also directed by Sean Nash. The cameramen were Gil Overhofer, Mark Collins, Jeff Biggs and myself. Um, the Big Blackmore Riot, a real fan favourite. We have officers with big rifles all over the prison. Craven played by Ray Ma. Lording it over everybody. <laughs> I know. Uh, just your memories of that riot. I, rem I remember a lot of the OB was, yes, in a, the scene was at Channel to the interior stuff, you know, through yelling through the window and and, you know, guns and you know, lots of screaming and what do we do? I, again, I loved all of that. And um, I, I remember because it was the first time I'd kind of done any TV acting. So I didn't know. I thought, how is this going to look? You know, it's so, I thought, it's so disjointed. Like, how are they going to edit it to make it look legit? Because we've done stuff here and stuff there. But it all comes together and looks amazing. And, of course, it all works on the day. But I just remember the chaos and the, and the, was that with Rita's brother, all the yelling out and, you yes. know, we, I think we even had Ray Mar in the studio calling out and us responding and uh, it was just hectic and fun. But I remember thinking, how the hell is this going to all mesh together? But it just kind of worked and it, it looked, came across and, and the interior works with the exterior. Like you said, Ken, this was a series that had been going for eight years. The, set designers and the art department and the editors and everything knew how and it would work you know they'd done this so many times you know um and it just came together but I just remember it being part of all of this chaos was exciting that was my next question to you when you got the scripts for the first, you know you're in the right episodes which were your first episodes were you like whoa this is yes. a big, you know a big part yeah <laughs> full on full on what have I gotten myself into do they trust me enough can I can I do this can I carry it off I'm just gonna have to go for it and you know do they just because I did that one little scene at the audition like right. can I am I capable of this responsibility but it's amazing and I found this more and more with my acting that you get on with the job you know that's your role and that's you know everybody has their role and that's how these series work you respect each other's role in putting something together like this and you learn that pretty quickly you just got to step up and get on with the job um, and and I remember Kendall Flanagan and Sean Nash I remember those um, directors they had a lot of faith in in us as actors too which was which helped immensely you and the inmates have taken over Blackmore you have the officers and other inmates hostage in the rec room tied up do you remember much from this really intense scene uh, you're the one holding the big rifle to off Officer Walter's head at the time. I love that. And it's funny because I got given some promo shots of me, you know, acting all tough with my chin out and looking all mean and rugged with the big gun. And I remember it weighing a ton. Um, <laughs> and that's the first time I'd really worked with a gun. And it's funny because 
I think the Roxanne character in the Flying Doctors uh, thing I did uh, had a gun. So maybe because I knew how to hold a gun, I don't know. But I remember there was a gun uh, stunt coordinator on set. Um, he would show me, it was taken very seriously, the use of guns. Um, they would show us that the barrel was empty before a take. Do you remember that going on, Ken, when they'd use guns? They'd, they used to cock the gun and show you and and show me how to hold it. Like it was real choreography. It was really taken seriously how to, because you'd have people who use guns in, you know, real life watching you. So you had to look um, legit. I and the part. Yeah. So I, I remember because we did a, a few takes and, and yes, I was the one holding the gun and, um, and because you're holding it to someone's head, you have to show them that it's empty. Like it was really quite serious. But I remember it being very heavy and my arms afterwards feeling a bit weak um, after using it. I, again, I love that scene. I think I, I loved, yeah, the grittiness of it. I, yeah, I really enjoyed doing that. But it was, yeah, big gun and heavy. We see Craven have Rita's brother Bongo handcuffed to the drain. Bongo was played by Shane Connor. Do you yes. remember much about working with Shane? I don't remember a lot because uh, Brumby didn't actually interact that much with him because he's with Craven. But um, I do know, I think he's a bit of a method actor too, but uh, he was amazing. He was fantastic at playing that because I, I remember he'd been roughed about by Craven, hadn't he? And it was, he was in a bit of a bad way and he was an ex-drug addict in it or that's right. And so it was pretty, pretty full on. Um, but I, I, Brumby didn't have any close scenes with him but I remember seeing him and and him staying in that in that character I think in between takes too. Do you remember much about I mean with the riot how long it took to film but was it over a few days with the riot or? Probably I know I can't I can't remember exactly but it would have been probably over a few days like yeah. I said we did exterior shots and interior shots and I, it was all very overwhelming for me as far as time it was probably all a little bit of a blur yeah. to me um you know, I was learning, learning on the job. The uh, the final scene of episode seventy nine has Rita starting a fire in the rec room as Craven ordered her brother Bongo to be killed. What was it like to start the fire and set fire to Blackmore? I know there was a lot of screaming from Rita. I remember <laughs> there was a lot of screaming from poor Glenda. Like it was a really exhausting uh, few scenes for her because of her brother. Like I remember her in between takes being emotionally and mentally exhausted because she was crying and screaming and yelling. It was really emotionally draining. But I, I can't, isn't that terrible? I can't remember a a lot of that. I just just remember poor um, Glenda being exhausted from that, really. It was a pretty intense scene she was playing in that episode. Yeah. Often poor Glenda got a lot of intense scenes over the months that I was on there. So then the next episode is you and the inmates from Blackmore arrive at Wentworth. What was it like being on the set of Wentworth? Like you're finally at Wentworth. You're, you're... Yeah, that that was surreal, walking into the set. I mean, even when you're rehearsing before it, you know, blocking your scenes through, that was just bizarre because, like I said, you've been watching it for so long um, and then all of a sudden you're in it. It's magical almost, like you've been plopped into, you know, something that, that isn't real. It's it's almost like being in a cartoon. Like it's just bizarre and the lights and the sets and and you think, oh my God, this is this is here. It's tangible. It's real. I'm here. Um, it's quite freaky. It's quite overwhelming and and bizarre to say the least. Well that was that was season eight, episode 104, where you arrived at Wentworth, which was written by Ian Smith and Mari Trevor, directed by Sean Nash. Cameramen were Wayne Lavender, Jeff Biggs, Mark Collins, and Ken Mulholland and Andrew Curry. Before we get into this episode, you had some amazing scenes with um, Kate Hood, who played Kath Maxwell. She was an amazing actress and a beautiful woman. Very, it's fun, like very softly spoken, very gentle again, um, just very kind. And, and she's gorgeous um, and had the most amazing long hair. I used to always be envious of her beautiful long she used to have that really long thick plait I think I remember playing with it in between scenes or something but she was yeah she was gorgeous and uh yes I, I over the over my episodes I did interact quite a bit with Kate Hood both your characters were always up against each other in prison yep yep there was always always butting heads she was yeah always deceiving and deceitful I think she 
knocked me out in like hit me over the head and for something I, I, can, I remember you know being practicing that the whack and me collapsing and you know in the door frame but yeah we were we but I think the character Kate Hood's character butted heads with most yeah. most of the the characters in Prisoner. We get to the final episode of Prisoner it's very end um, there's a scene where you're all in the dining room and have just found out that Rita is no longer alive. Some of you were crying. What was it like to shoot that scene? And I watched it just recently and it was quite incredible. Well, yeah, I remember it being very, um, us being um, sincerely upset because it, the, the whole thing was coming to an end. And I think some of those upset, those tears and those emotions were raw and real. And also it was a very sad ending to the character of Rita. I think we legitimately were very, very sad across the board from what I remember. Yeah, I, I remember being quite sincerely upset by the whole thing. I'd like to see that. I, I've got episodes on VHS, can you believe it, somewhere. I think back at my mum's. I need to see that again, but yeah, I think the tears, if if there were any, and uh, and the the melancholy scene was legit because it was we were realizing that this was the whole thing was coming to an end, and it was just such a such a wonderful experience and a lovely group of people that that worked on the show. It was very sad across the board. I think. What were your thoughts on the ending of Prison? We see Joan Ferguson finally gets brought undone by everything she's done for the last four or so years in prison. Yep. She goes to her cell. You start that chant. You're the first person. That's right. Ferguson. Yeah, Rita's dead. You're crying. What was it like to to film that scene and you, you starting the chant? I, I loved it that she got her comeuppance. I loved it. I think we all thought that was fantastic. Yeah, the way it, it was fantastic that it ended, the, the freak got what she had coming to her for a long time. We loved that that was the case. I think everybody was really pleased that that's the way it was ended. Uh, and I felt wrapped that I was the one that started, little Brumby Tucker was the one that started the chant. Um, to give her some of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, you freak. Yeah, no, it was great. It was um, it was a good good feeling that the freak got her ending like that. No, it was what a brilliant scene with Maggie in the cell at the end. Like you could just yeah, face. yeah, everything had just you know her life just flashed before her, falling apart, yeah. sucked in. <laughs> No, no, it was great. She, you had to, the baddie has to get it in the end. She um, was horrid over the years. So, um, no, that we thought that was that was great. It was exciting. I, I'm as sad as it was that the prisoner was finishing. I, I feel honoured and and grateful that I was part of not only the show but the ending. On that last day, I was quite gratified to see that Bud Tingwell had a had a, a role in that very last episode because he'd been not only an actor who we'd worked with a lot, but he'd also been a director and just such a wonderful, lovely... Oh, beautiful man. Role. Yes, beautiful man. And it's funny, uh, I, I got to work with Sheila Florence and Bud Tingwell in a different capacity. Someone was put doing... I don't know if someone was putting together... Um, wanted to put together a few scenes for a film they were writing. This was uh, a couple of months after Prisoner. And I don't even know how I got to do it. And it was about a young punk girl, because often I'd be stereotyped being the punk girl there for a while, um, and an old lady and their relationship. And she was the old lady, of course, and I was the young punk girl. And Bud was directing us. And we went to some independent studio somewhere. And we filmed a couple of scenes of this film that someone was trying to get funding for. Um, and so I actually got to work with the likes of Sheila Florence because I unfortunately didn't get to work with uh, Lizzie and B and all those, you know, when it was in its real heyday. And, and so I did get to work with Sheila Florence and Bud Tingwell as a director um, in a different capacity um, after Prisoner, which I feel grateful for that I, and she was a character. She was a real character. So I, yeah, and Bud was beautiful. Yes, yes, yeah, such so such a beautiful man. He was so calm. Always. And, and he really was supportive from what I remember of, you know, I had a bit of an energy about me at the time and um, I'd bound in on set, you know, and uh, 
there'd be Gerda and Bud with their scripts. But they never made me feel like I couldn't be me. They never felt, made me feel, you know, like my word or my thoughts or input was any less than, you know, I never, ever felt that. I, you know, some actors that I've worked with in later years, you know, you think, oh, I better, you know, pull my head in there. Um, you know, don't approach them, don't look sight. But the the people that I worked with on Prisoner, there was a realness to them. You know, it was it was a family feel. We were all in it together. It felt like a real community. And same with the crew, I thought too, Ken, because the crew had been working on it for so many years. Everybody, there was no hierarchy. Um, and same with the extras that we worked with on Prisoner. We had extras that worked on Prisoner from the get-go, didn't we? That we were all in the green room together. It wasn't that person's in that Winnebago and you're in this. We were all in it together. We'd have our coffees. We'd talk about our families. It was a real um, supportive uh, environment and and rare and rare, unfortunately. Um, you know, it, it had a great vibe. That also shows on the show that you guys had all that with the crew. And oh, that's good. Yep. That last episode where Ferguson's been led outside by the police into the police car, all the inmates are standing on the other side, and the, the camera the, the camera works brilliant. It's cutting to every inmate, a flash, back to Ferguson. Back yes, to inmate. yes. That was a brilliant scene. What was that like? I mean, that was the final ever. I remember, I think we were standing up on a an embankment from That's what right. I remember. So even the positioning of us, above her walking down with her like really helped us pardon me get into that you know us against her we've we've finally got you yeah it was it was great um and even you know I, I remember looking down and her looking up at all of us or maybe she didn't but I just remember looking down at at, at the freak and it's it was really um powerful you know it was yeah it was good fun <laughs> She got her come up and who doesn't love that? Was there an after party? Oh, there was. I think to keep because so many actors and crew and people had been involved with Prisoner over the years. From what I remember, Ken, I think they only allowed people that had worked on it thusly, like in the last episodes, to go. Is that right? I vaguely remember that because it would have been a <laughs> thousands of, you know, people. And so from what I remember, there was... Um, it was just mainly the the initial, the crew and the cast that had worked on those final episodes that went to the after party. Is that right? Well, I can't answer that because I didn't go. Oh, why not? I'd gotten myself rostered off halfway through the day and I knew because I'd worked on the very first episode and worked a lot of the episodes through that time, I knew how emotional it was going to be yeah. and I just couldn't Could. couldn't go because I, I just I knew that I, I would be an absolute mess. Yeah, right. Because I remember Jeff Biggs a lot at that party <laughs> getting pretty messy. Yes, I, well, Je Jeff was a riot even when he was sober. So, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I think I've got photos of Jeff, yeah, behind the camera, but... I remember it was very crowded. There were a lot of people. It was at Channel 10 um, in the studio. And, it, it, there, yeah, emotions were high. And I, I do remember Jeff having a few drinks. <laughs> and, it, and a lot of the crew in particular were more emotional than the, the cast because I think it had been your home for so many years, like you say, for the eight years. And I think that's why they let their hair down. Um, the most, I mean, the the cast had come and gone, you know, of course, there were some people there for two, three, four years. Um, I mean, how many years did Elspeth Valentine and well, Joy she was, Westmore? She, she was there through the whole series. Yeah. And she's someone who I actually couldn't face on that day because right. she, she, we'd given each other gifts on that last day. And, yep. uh, but I did catch up with um, Ellie again on Neighbours when I worked on Neighbours after, after a prisoner uh, because she played uh, Kathy Alessi. That's right. I oh, think. gosh, you guys have got good memories. Yeah. And uh, when she walked into the studio and, and, and I was there working a camera, 
we just looked at each other and we just embraced. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty emotional. So did yeah. you go on to work on Neighbours for yes, quite I a while? Yes. So were you there when I when I did? You would have been there with Kylie and Jason and maybe uh, yes, you weren't. I yes, I was. Uh, I was there working on, on it with the um, with the big wedding between Kylie and, and Jason Donovan and, and Kylie yep. Minogue. But I may not have recognised you because you changed your hair colouring and... Um, yep. If you were yep. in the studio, uh, I didn't do locations, but if you were in the studio, I may not have actually picked, oh, that's Brumby. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, you, you probably looked totally different. I did. I did. I was a bit of a Cindy Lauper type of character. I was all, uh, often for a couple of years there, I was always the punk or the freak head or the alternative kind of girl I was cast and so that's why I grew my hair and w then I you know wanted to do something different and was uh, was the preacher's wife in the man from Snow River so quite quite different indeed for four years I worked on the man from Snow River looking complete in period frock a far cry from the likes of Brumby Tucker and Roxanne and you know and all these punky characters I'd played but yes I do remember the the final party I don't remember a lot of it, so maybe I'd had a few to drink <laughs> too. But I do remember, I do remember Jeff Biggs being quite under the weather, you might say, and and a lot of the crew um, quite emotional, um, in particular. What was it true they were pulling yeah. the sets down as the final episode was being filmed? Was it? I, I read. Oh, probably. I can't remember. I really can't remember. I don't know if I. I wasn't. That could have very well been the case. I wasn't there. The last day, I think I had a morning scene and then I went home to get ready for the after party. So, or I'm, I, I don't remember, I wasn't there at the very, the last, last episode of that day. I, I don't think I was there for that. So that very well may have been the case. I've got a fan question from Gavin Athey. Uh, he'd like to know what your favourite scene was to shoot. It, like I said, anything that was, emotionally driven be that you know that gritty physical kind of scene or um you know something emotional I often I often really enjoyed um that sort of thing I loved I loved it when Brumby was getting up to mischief there was a a, a room I think when you they had a reward room and a, and a yeah a reward cell which was like an apartment and then they had a cell across the hall that had bars, like a punishment cell. So I, I think I ended up in the punishment cell, um, which would be right. I enjoyed the scene where I tried to escape as um, oh, as Joy good. West. Yeah. yeah, the screw, that was just silly um, yeah. and funny. And they had the comical music. Anything that, I guess any scene that was emotionally driven, I enjoyed. But I can't think of any one one scene per se, I have to say. I hope I get this surname right. Kevin McCotchy from Scotland would like to ask, what do you think would have become of Brumby after the series ended? Would she have got Ooh. that elusive escape? Because you're always trying to... <laughs> I don't know. I, I think she probably learned her lesson with the escapes and probably matured a bit. And after the death of Rita, she probably thought, I better just do out my time and get it over and done with. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. But, yeah, hopefully she would have matured and grown up a bit um, And since the passing of, you know, of Rita. Or maybe because the girls were her family, she just kept trying to escape and wanted to stay in jail because that's all she knew. Who knows? Good question. I really, I don't know. Uh, Dale Leishman wanted to say that he, he just loved you in The Man from Snowy River. Oh. Um, the McGregor saga. So yes, tell us a little bit about Snowy River. Well, it was um, a series it, taken from the film, uh, like, a, a, well, taken from the Banjo Patterson poem, um, The Man from Snowy River. There were the two films with um, Sigrid Thornton. Um, so it wasn't the film, it was a series. There was Guy Pearce, Andrew Clark, um, who was the man, the man. Um, Wendy Hughes, the beautiful Wendy Hughes. Brett Climo, who played my husband, um, lots of beautiful actors and actresses. And it was about um, the, the, the man from the man from Snow River, his family. So 
McGregor was his name. And we were, uh, there was um, gorgeous Jolene Kanogarak um, was the daughter, Guy Pierce and Brett Clymer were the, the brothers. And then I was married to one of the sons, the brothers, Brett Climo. And um, I was on that for four years. And, and to start with, it, my character was um, Emily McGregor. And um, she was, you know, this very demure, church-going, mousy kind of woman. So I had a couple of scenes in the first, uh, sorry, a couple of episodes in the first season. And then it, I married into the family and then the character grew and grew and grew. And, um, and I was on there for the full four years. And I had the best time. And it's funny, you know, other than Prisoner, I was saying, you know, with the, with the support and the community feel and that love, I got that again on The Man from Snow River for the four years. Um, Guy Pierce, I worked with briefly on Neighbours and, um, and Brett Clymer, I worked briefly with uh, on um, a country practice. I did a couple of guest roles on a country practice. So I already kind of knew them. And then, you know, working with that, that we just had the best fun. It was all on location up at um, Dalesford and Hepburn Springs and Trentham up, up that way. It was beautifully shot. It was a period show, completely different to Prisoner. I wore big frocks and corsets and, it, you know, it was just magnificent. I, and um, there was some horse riding, not that I, my character, I, I, wore, I did sulkies like, you know, horse and cart sort of thing. I had a lot of stunt doubles for that. But it was quite different to Prisoner and I, I had a ball on that too and I loved it and um, that was really sad also when that finished. So, um, yeah, I, it was quite different to Prisoner but I, I loved working on that. It was just so much fun and, and, yeah, we supported and loved each other heaps and, yeah, and the lovely Wendy Hughes has since passed away. I know we've touched on your mullet but Martin James Beef, <laughs> I want to ask if you were fond of the mullet hairdo. <laughs> Well, it wasn't called a mullet back then. It was just a kind of punky hair style. Come back now as well. It is. Years. Oh, <laughs> yeah. People are doing it on purpose. No, the reason my hair was kind of like that was because I'd done that mini series in between, and I, I every three weeks they dye my hair white blonde because they wanted that stereotypical, and I'd get um, solariums, which aren't really allowed. So. So I, you know, brown. Back then they had solariums. Oh God, yes. And I'd get one every three weeks. I'd have a solarium to try and get brown. And my hair was dyed white. And after many, many months of that, my hair, I, I wanted to just break away from that look. So I dyed it black and with all the dye, it just started falling out. So I had, it was already kind of a punk because I was a punk kind of character and in between. So my my hair would just was over dyed and just kind of was broken and fell out a lot. So I didn't kind of make the mullet on purpose, but um, I didn't really, I thought it was fitting for the character of Brumby anyway. So it didn't really bother me, but yeah, I didn't purposely yeah, you <laughs> cut it like that. Or what mullets are today. It could be because of you. I wish. <laughs> I know. I know. Who knows? <laughs> There's a couple more questions which actually just sneaked in overnight. So Ken doesn't actually have these ones. They came through oh, yeah. last night via our Facebook page. Um, John Walters from the UK said, does she think prisoner fans are bonkers or lovable? Oh, <laughs> lovable. <laughs> lovable. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. I, I don't feel worthy of the love. Like... No, I, I think it's amazing. No, I think it's wonderful. I'm very, um, I feel very touched that people, oh, you know, I'm an old broad. It's all good. It's all good. Peter and Jessica Quinn just wanted to say that you're such an amazing actress. They just, Aww. Joan Harrison wanted to say that she's so beautiful. Oh. Cole Taylor, Aww. he remembers you in Neighbours and obviously we just spoke about Neighbours before. Wow. So. Yep. And... One other one was, which I've actually got a copy of in my house, the DVD of The Big Steel. It was oh, yeah. A, it was an amazing Australian movie. Yeah, there's a comment from James saying how he loved you in it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Oh, wow. Yes. The the Big Steel. My gosh. Yes, with Ben Mendelsohn and, yeah, yeah. and the lovely Cla Claudia Carvin. Yeah. That was amazing. An amazing experience. Yeah, I, I had a, a hoot on that too with uh, Nadia Tass. 
directing that. Um, that it's also long ago, but yeah, that that to be part of that, which is also a and Steve Bisley was in that. Exactly. All these wonderful actors that I got to to work with. That was awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody, for those lovely questions. It's lovely. I'm I'm very touched. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, thanks so much for joining us on Talking Prison. It's been amazing to have you on and, and learn. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Ken. It's so lovely to be part of it, and I, and I feel grateful and honoured that uh, you asked me on the on the show. And I wish you all the best with it. And I can't wait to see who else you get on here. Awesome. All right. Awesome. You thank you. All right, you take care, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. Definitely. See you soon. See you guys. Mm -hmm.